I'll, I'll mute everybody. I'll, I'll oh. mute everybody and then unmute yourself. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the LA Multifamily Meetup. Been doing this for quite a few years now. We have over a thousand people part of our group. A lot of people watching our stuff on YouTube. And we're back today with a really special guest, which we haven't had someone like Bob for a while. So um, I was explaining um, our session today to a few people and they were super interested. So I'm interested to hear what Bob has to say. We'll, we'll find out who Bob is in just a minute if you don't know yet. Um, but I'm Anthony Volan. I am the owner and broker of The Collective. We are a, um, a real estate brokerage that covers greater LA and tend to do deals, I mean, all over Southern California as well. Uh, we have an amazing multifamily division that Will Tiao heads up. Um, and Will will get to talk to you in just a moment as well. Um, I was just at um, a California Association of Realtors event last week, and I was um, in line at the little snack shack next to the National Association of, Pres National Association of Realtors president, um, Bob Goldberg. And he, I knew the day before, he was in a meeting with President Biden. So we chatted a little bit. And of course, you know, um, I think especially in this group's mind is what the heck is gonna happen with 1031 exchanges? Everyone is saying they're gonna go away or there's gonna be a limit. Um, and he had news. So he was very confident with what was gonna happen. And I said, how confident are you? Are you sure? Can I tell people this is like, yes. He's like, I'm very confident this is going to happen. So, you know, nothing's done until it's done. But he did say that 1031 exchanges, he believed um, and Biden believes that they will be here and there will not be a limit, that they will be remaining. So this is really, really good news. Um, and I said, you know, what was some of the thinking? What was, you know, he's like, oh, he's like, no, they all get it. They all understand how important it is that if 1031s were to disappear and we weren't able to have this tax write off, then um, nobody would sell their properties and people would just hold on to them. And they understand that that's not the best thing for the overall economy um, and as well. So they get that when a property sells, there's a lot of jobs created. Uh, uh, Will gets employed, Bob gets employed, Zoe gets employed, and some of you else that are on here as well start to have an opportunity to um, have a job during that transaction. So um, they understand that and they want to keep that flow happening. So, you know, let's stay tuned to that. But um, he said he was very, very confident. I said 95%. He's like, higher than that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to be watching out, Bob. I'm like, I get a little nervous. So it's done. But he's like, no, that it should be good. And I said, well, how about um, step up basis? Is that going to be able to remain? What's going on with that? That one, he said, that one is not done yet. But he said, I could say that at least 90% chance that that will remain as well. So that's, he says, looking really, really good. Um, so these are great things, um, very excited about, and we'll keep informing you as soon as we hear anything um, going forward, because it's a huge, huge, huge part of um, multifamily business and something that we all use. And if we haven't used yet, most likely we'll use as a tool to building wealth. So um, besides our multifamily group, you know, the, our office of the collective is also doing um, a lot of seminars and education for um, home ownership and building wealth through home ownership as well. Our next one is our, you know, 101 to becoming a homeowner. Um, so if you know anyone or you want to attend as well, um, I'll add the information in the chat, but lahomebuyerseminar.com um, is the RSVP link for our homebuyer seminar coming up November 4th at 4 p.m. It's a Thursday. Um, it will be recorded as well in case you miss it, but if you want to join in and ask questions to um, an amazing lender, we'll have an hour uh, session on um, what it takes to become a homeowner now, credit requirements, different loan programs that are out there, um, what's happening with multiple offers, what are some of the hot areas, and so on. So that will be on November 4th. Um, so let's get into the meeting. We have a great group here today. Um, I'd love to give everybody a moment to introduce yourself if you'd like to 
Um, let us know what you do. Uh, that would be great. Like I said, you never know who's looking for you or who you're looking for. Um, and feel free to use the chat to get to know people a little bit more as well. Uh, but why don't we start with Will? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Will Tiao. Um, I am a broker associate with the Collective Realty, and I am the director of the commercial real estate division at our brokerage. And I specialize in multifamily sales. Um, I also have a property management company called Tiao Properties. We manage uh, nearly 200 units throughout Los Angeles, uh, the Los Angeles region. Uh, and, uh, and we've done, we've done over a hundred million dollars in, in multifamily sales. So, so we've done a, a couple <laughs> and, uh, and know, know a bit about, about this market. So uh, we, uh, I'm the co-host of this. Um, usually also the one that finds the speakers. I'm very excited to have our speaker today and um, look forward to, to meeting you all and, and talking more multifamily. All right, and Miss Zoe. Hi there, I'm Zoe Schulman with WFG Title. Lovely to meet everybody. And just to let you all know at WFG, if you are an investor, you own more than one property, we offer a 30% discount when you sell your property for title. Mm. So just an FYI, we can help you maintain and keep more of your profits. I'll put my email and my phone number in the chat in case you want to reach out to me. Nice to meet everybody. Thanks, Zoe. Danielle. Hello, I'm Danielle Bonner. Um, when I'm not uh, living my life as Wonder Woman, I've, I've been a realtor at the collective since 2015. Um, I've also uh, been a property manager uh, residential since uh, 2009, and I'm just about to get into commercial property management um, very soon. So I'm excited about that. Great. Welcome back. And welcome Thank back, Miss Ellen. Oh, we need you to unmute Ellen. Ellen and then after Ellen, Ellen will be Ray. Hi, uh, my name is Ellen Chu, and I'm a trustee of a family trust. So I'm uh, managing a trust that has rental properties. And I'm a client of Will Tiao, and I've been working with him for my rental properties. Thank you. Welcome, Ray, and then Mary. Oh, Ray's muted. <laughs> Ray, you need to unmute yourself. Got it. Okay, uh, Ray, uh, Richie, I help manage 50 doors residential and a couple commercial and doing a lot of the maintenance and marketing. And right now just trying to figure out what to do next in the way of giving advice for investing because it's a very strange environment. Yeah, Mary. Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Allen. I am a property manager, uh, recently joined Chow Properties. I'm very excited about that. And I'm also an investor. Welcome, Ms. Sarah, and then Melissa. Hello, my name is uh, Sarah Caparella. I'm the leasing agent for Tiao Properties. So um, I basically handle the leasing for Will's Properties, um, doing the uh, marketing descriptions, everything that would go into trying to get a, a unit leased. Great. Melissa, and then Charles, if you'd like. Hello, I am Melissa Gonzalez. I am a property manager um, for a company, a boutique firm out of Long Beach. And I am just new to Los Angeles. So I'm actually looking to connect with people who work with multifamily investors. Welcome, welcome. Charles, and then Yahira. Uh, hi, I'm Charles. I'm an entrepreneur and developer. I'm working on a uh, property management and payment portal um, right now, and I'm looking for quality uh, partners to partner up with. Great. Welcome. I, am I saying it right, Yahira? If you want to unmute. Oh, that's yeah. right. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just new to investing, so I'm just looking to learn some new things. Great. Welcome, welcome. And Nazanin and then Gina. Hello. 
Yes, hi, uh, I'm Nazanin. Same thing, I am an investor and want to get more information and connect with people. Thank you. Great, so good to see all of you here. The more you know, the more your money can grow. <laughs> and Gina hi. and then Valerie. <laughs> Hello, hi everyone. Um, my name is Gina. Um, I'm a video editor, um, actually, but um, what I would like to be is a um, uh, investor, um, you know, start with house hacking, hopefully, and then uh, work my way up to having um, a portfolio. So um, just want to want to learn from, you know, everyone at the panel. Thank you. Amazing. We just heard from a lender yesterday that the FHA limits are going up um, mm -hmm. sometime soon. Um, which means for duplexes up to fourplexes, possibly mm -hmm. the fourplex limit may even be up to 2 million where you can put three and a half percent down. So we will get you more information on that, but it's an interesting concept. And with the higher limits, it's, I think it's going to open up a lot of doors for people in LA, especially. Right, so, right. Welcome. Thank you. And Valerie and then Ryan. It is Valerie. Oh, she moved. Hi, Valerie. Hey, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Valerie. Uh, I am a real estate attorney, currently non-practicing, but uh, I am one of Will's uh, clients and also uh, interested in investments and getting to meet you all. Welcome. And Ryan and then Anarsha. Oh, uh, my name is uh, Ryan, I'm actually an accountant. Uh, my wife and I uh, actually just bought our first rental property um, in uh, Pennsylvania, actually a little over a month ago. And we're also looking to acquire a small multifamily uh, in the next couple of months. So uh, this is actually my first meetup uh, with this group. And I'm just kind of hoping to yeah, learn a little bit more about you know, valuation methods and just kind of all the, all the fun things that come with multifamily. Wonderful. We just, um, you'll definitely learn a lot today. And we did a class specifically on uh, evaluations that's on our website. So I'll post the link um, so you can check out the YouTube video on there as well. Um, Christopher and then Iwana. Okay, no, Chris, maybe go there. Everybody keeps moving around. Christopher, <laughs> oh, I hey, see you. Hey, there sorry, you go. I don't, I don't have my video on. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure what the question was because I joined late, but I'm a realtor in LA and I'm personally looking to start investing in multifamily, small, uh, two, two and four unit uh, building. My partner. Wonderful. Very I'm smart. Just learn more about the process. Great, well, you're in the right place. And Iwana, and then Inertia. Hey guys, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, okay. Um, it's my first time actually joining in and um, on this meetup stuff, but exactly what did you want? I, I came in a little later, so I oh, wasn't okay. sure what the question was. Everyone is just introducing themselves. If you're an investor or looking to learn how to invest or a realtor, just um, who you are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So um, I'm actually looking to invest. I don't. I'm. I don't know much about um, investing in commercial, so I want to learn more about it, and hoping to obtain that here. Okay. Welcome. So when we use the term commercial, we refer to five units or more. And if you're buying a duplex, triplex, or fourplex, then it's still residential, but it's multifamily. So, but all of them are great opportunities to start building wealth. And Anarsha. My camera's not on. Um, I'm driving, but I am a, an investor in upstate New York. I have a couple multifamilies and I also have one commercial property and I'm looking to just learn more and hopefully meet other investors I can team up with for new projects. Welcome. One of the cool advantages of having Zoom is you can kind of chime in from anywhere. <laughs> um, Diana, did you want to introduce yourself? I saw you pop in. Hi, this is Diana Tiao. I am um, Will Tell's partner and um, 
we run Tail Properties. Um, I am in charge of the property management. So I work with a lot of uh, owners who need help with their properties in terms of management. And i um, really excited to be here. Uh, I've met Bob a couple of times at the properties and um, looking forward to hearing, um, just learning from Bob. And uh, there's a bunch of different changes with LA City um, in terms of their um, inspections. So definitely want to hear more about uh, Bob's thoughts and see how we can best um, you know, make any adjustments for our properties that we currently manage and our future clients. Perfect. And Diana, we've talked that the city is going out to inspect properties every two years, right? And I'm curious to know, um, you know, through Bob, like, what are some things that come up a lot that he looks for? What are some things that all of you as investors are seeing popping up? And I know a lot of questions were already submitted to Will. So I'll turn it over to Will Tiao at this point, and we'll get right into the main part of our program. So go ahead, Bob. Thank you, Anthony. Before I begin, I just have to say on a personal note, uh, Diana and I were married nine years ago today. So I just want to say happy anniversary. To yeah. Aww. <laughs> happy anniversary. Thank you. Love so. it. Putting up hearts. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, so my name is Will. Again, Will Tiao. Um, as I mentioned, I am a multifamily um, investment advisor, broker, associate with the collective, focusing on multifamily sales. Um, the property management side is run by my wife and partner, uh, Diana. And as you met, met um, Mary Allen is our lead property manager. Sarah Caffarella is our leasing agent. And um, yeah, we, you know, uh, we manage a few hundred units in the LA area. Um, and we are investors and landlords ourselves. So uh, we have a very good idea of both the opportunities and the challenges that uh, landlords face in this, uh, in this environment. So um, I always take a few minutes to talk about where things are at in kind of the Southern California multifamily market. Um, so um, what I've noticed is that there is definitely been a, um, how shall we say, there's a lot more movement now. Like things have been pretty slow when COVID hit. I think, you know, particularly most of 2020, everybody was in the multifamily sector was still trying to figure out what was happening. We had eviction moratoriums. We had people not paying rent. People were not sure if multifamily was still a sector that they want to invest in. We were starting to see uh, drops in rent, which we hadn't seen in years in Los Angeles. Um, you know, you were you were starting to see like kind of what many people thought might be a shift in the market. And I would say that that lasted all the way up until about like first quarter of this year. After the first quarter of this year, starting the second and third and now going to the fourth quarter, things have just been ramping up more and more. And we're also seeing that on the management side, meaning that we're starting to see rents, they have, you know, they kind of bottomed out, I would say in the first quarter of this year, and now they've just started coming back up. This is the one advantage I would say of having a property management side. A lot of, a lot of broker, people often either have a brokerage or they only do brokerage or they do property management. Um, which is totally understandable because each one takes a lot of work. But, um, but the one good thing about having both sides is that we kind of have like this granular detail about what's happening in the market as it's happening. And the one thing we're seeing right now is that rents are starting to come back. Uh, our vacancy rates are going down. A lot of people had left during that 20, 2020, early 2021 period, and now we're starting to see people come back. Uh, I don't know if it's coming back or there are new people coming in or what it is, but our vacancy rates have started to decrease. And I'm noticing that with other companies across the board, which means generally speaking is that multifamily in general is starting to come back. We are starting to see more activity. We're starting to see more sales and we're starting to see uh, lower cap rates again and higher DRMs. Uh, for those of you who don't, know what those mean. 
Um, we do, as Anthony said, uh, we do have tutorials online on our, on our website. It's also something I can walk you through, but they're basically methods of valuation, right? Cap rates, GRMs, gross rent multipliers. That's generally how people uh, value uh, income properties, mostly through income. So um, I thought I would go through some of the things that some of the stuff we're dealing with in the market right now. Um, and then as many of you know, who have been in the room before, we always do a wants and needs section. So if people have deals that they're either looking to pitch or that they're looking to buy, um, you know, this is the room to do it in. Um, so let me share my screen for a second. Can all of you see this? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so let me move you over to this. So we just closed on um, this property. Is it is Lexington pulling up? Is the MLS pulling up right now? Uh, it's loading. It's loading. Okay, good. Okay, so this is a 10 unit property I just closed on last week. Um, it's so it's 10 units, eight one bedrooms and two two bedrooms. As you can see, if you look at the rents, they were fairly low. Average rent was between seven, uh, between 650 and $700, $750. So for one bedroom, which is very low. And then the two bedrooms were getting about 1200 or so, which is still very low for a two bedroom. Actually, that's even lower than a typical one bedroom price. Um, we had, um, so I have valued this property initially at 2 million. And I told my client this, and uh, he was like getting lots of mail from a lot of other brokers saying, oh, it's worth more, blah, 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 blah. Um, all trying to get the listing. So we started at a higher place. I think we started at 2395. And, um, you know, we had a few offers. They didn't work out after they saw the building. Uh, we lowered the price to 225. And then, you know, once again, this was a building that hadn't been, you know, um, hadn't been sold in over 50 years. Um, and um, basically, we ended up selling it for about 200 a door. Um, this is a classic value add play, right? This is one of those situations where an investor is going to go in, they're probably going to try to uh, negotiate buyouts with the, with the current tenants, if possible and uh, try to get them try to get them up to market rents. So um, I've been getting a lot of calls about this one because a lot of people were like, why didn't I see this? And I'm like, well, you did see it because <laughs> it was out there in the marketplace, but it was higher. It was priced higher because that's what we're, where my client wanted to go. But we ended up actually at the number that I fit, thought, thought that, that we would. We actually got a number of offers in the 1 million range. Um, and that's because they looked at the cap rate, which was very low, it was in the twos. GRM was over 20. And people were like, oh, that's, you know, the income is just too low. But people, you know, the investor who ended up buying it, looked at it, saw what he could do with it, and ended up paying that price. Um, on the flip side, I now have, um, we now have, oh, well, I'll show you this one that we're in escrow on. This we're doing on the buy side. This is a six unit in Boyle Heights. They're all two bedroom, one baths. We're in escrow for a client that we already do management for. Um, I think asking was like right around one, four, five, one, four, or one, four, nine, five or something like that. We're in, we're in escrow for a little bit uh, closer to one, four. And um you know, all two bedroom, one baths, pretty clean. There's some, you know, the, there's some issues here and there. Uh, the, uh, and the uh, appraisal came back in like the mid one fours. And, um, you know, good, good. I would say not bad cap rate. I think the cap rate was about four and a half. And the, um, and the GRM was about a 15, which in this market is pretty good. So, um, you know, if you have any questions about cap rates or GRMs in a particular area, feel free to reach out and, and ask me. Um, this is kind of on the higher end of what we do, um, higher end meaning like on the turnkey end. So we, we often run into buildings either 
on on the one side is value add like you know deferred maintenance you know low rents uh that's like what what we had at lexington versus turnkey which is like building is totally good to go <laughs> like ready to go so this building these are actually two buildings in the heart of west hollywood it's on San Vicente near Melrose, just across from the Pacific Design Center. So you can't get more central than that, right? I mean, you're right next to Beverly Hills. You're um, near Santa Monica, Robertson, Melrose, Beverly Center, everything, all that shopping along Robertson. Um, you know, they're totally turnkey buildings. Uh, you can, these are the insides of the units. They're gorgeous. They're fully furnished. The current owner was renting them as short-term rental. So in West Hollywood, what that means is 30 days or more. Uh, you can't do less than that um, by law. And uh, the penthouse has a rooftop deck. Um, we're listing this at 5.35 million. Now you might say, God, that sounds, you know, that's a lot of money. But, but if you do the math and you look at what the rental rates are in this area for two bedroom, two bath, you know, fully furnished, you know, with den, like he was getting 5K for short-term rentals. And I was arguing, and I am arguing, and I, I truly believe this, is that I think you can get that for a long-term rental, <laughs> for a long-term furnished rental, you know? So, um, and those numbers at that rate, you know, get you a very, very low GRM. It gets you like a 14 and a half GRM, which in West Hollywood is unheard of, right? GRMs in uh, West Hollywood are closer to 17, 18. I have even seen a 19 before. So, um, so just something, you know, to consider. I also have a couple of, um, uh, of deals that are coming on the market. Um, I'm gonna stop the share if I can. Um, so I got a couple of off-market deals that are coming on the market. I have one value add uh, in Silver Lake. It's a six unit um, on Mitchell Terreno, which is a very central, uh, like major intersection, major street in um, in Silver Lake, uh, six units, four one bedrooms, two two bedrooms, same situation as Lexington. Long term owner owned it more than fifty years. Uh, of uh, one unit is being delivered vacant. Five have long term tenants, and we are offering that at one point four three million. Uh, so uh, if you have anyone who's interested in that, let me know. Then I have two turnkeys that are going to be coming on the market soon. Uh, one is in Silver Lake and the other is in like South Echo Park, Westlake area. Uh, both of those are turnkey. They're, the Westlake one is five units, um, three three-bedroom units and two two-bedroom units. Great income, uh, all top dollar market rents, seven parking spaces. That's going to be offered at 2.8 million. I think that's a 4.24 um, uh, cap rate. And then I have a six unit in Silver Lake. Um, and this was one of the first buildings in Los Angeles that got a permitted multifamily ADU, which is uh, fairly, you know, still new in the market. And um, so he's got five two bedrooms and then the ADU is a one bedroom. And he's got top of market rents for all of them. Uh, and he's offering that at like a four, four cap. And that's gonna be listed at 3 million. So if you have, if you're interested or you have any clients who are interested in either the turnkey or the value add, reach out to me directly. I'll put my information in the chat and we can discuss from there. If anybody else has anything that they wanna add or they have any deals that they're looking for um, or that they have that they wanna pitch, now is the time. So um, you can raise your hand. There's a, the reaction button that you have at the bottom. There's a little thing down there that says you can raise your hand or, you know, you just uh, turn on your camera, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, and and uh, we can go from there. Charles, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, well, I, so in terms of properties, we're looking for um, roughly anything that's in the seven to 10 bedroom range. Um, in a uh, cost range of 3.5 to 4.5, um, anywhere in the LA area, that's kind of our sweet spot. And then uh, as far as the opportunity that I'm working on, uh, I'm working on a custom real estate management portal that helps for uh, 
property managers that have multiple properties with multiple tenants and it, it handles uh, reoccurring payments as well as it's going to handle floor plans and things like that, making it very easy to collect payments. And uh, as well as we're also looking for feedback in terms of uh, what people want in it. Right now we have our first client and we're trying to uh, line up a few more right now, as well as we're looking for early stage partners. So Charles, let me ask you in terms of what you're looking for, are you looking for a value add or are you looking for turnkey? Uh, turnkey. You want turnkey? Yeah, um, that's what, uh, that. so uh, as of right now, how I came into this, I found a community living. Um, uh, it's kind of a, an, an entity that has about 10 properties in the LA area. And uh, they, right now they split up all of, uh, all of their houses with multiple beds. And right now they're managing it just by uh, text messaging people for Venmo and whatnot. And I came in and I said, hey, I can build you a payment portal. And we can, you know, make this into something that uh, might be useful. And then I looked up like co-living.com and I saw that they're just killing it right now. So I built out the payment portal and it's almost complete right now. And uh, I'm starting to give demos to uh, early stage partners. That's very interesting information. We were actually planning to have a co-living speaker come and it'll probably come next month, um, you know, because it's definitely an area that seems to be, uh, you know, getting more and more traction in the multifamily space because obviously cost per bed is, you know, per for, for each tenant is much more affordable, but also from a investor's perspective, it allows you to also, you know, build up, you know, um, you know, rents per unit. So that's great to know. So thank you. I, 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 I would totally agree with you. I think that like, it's a hot space right now. And uh, like, so the, the trajectory of uh, the first client that I'm working with is, uh, they, seven of their 10 houses have been in the last 14 months, which is signs of a hyper, hyper accelerated growth startup, which is what got me interested in it in the first place. But thank you for the time. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Um, I have an agent I work with who is looking for, has two, two investors. Each one is looking for um, uh, owner user situation. So they're looking for, uh, so I have one who's up to 1.2 and she's looking for a triplex where she could live in one of the units and rent out the other two, either in the Boyle Heights or Inglewood areas. The other one is looking up to 1.7 and is open, he's also he's looking more for turnkey and he's also looking for something that he could live in and uh, rent out. If anybody has anything like that, please let me know. Anyone else? Mary, I know you, you, you're looking for stuff. Ah, uh, can't hear you. Yeah, I am. And I did, I've done a lot of looking mostly at, duplex, uh, triplex uh, in the LA area. I think I'm, um, I am probably, I, I'm considering uh, different neighborhoods right now. So I'm really interested in City Terrace and Glassell Heights, um, Highland Park, and also um, ideally uh, something that would be a property I could live in as well. So, um, and preferably that has like, if it's a duplex, two separate structures. So I am hoping prices will come down a bit. Um, what I've seen out there mostly needs a lot of work, but that's the fun part too. <laughs> yes, it is. Um... So if anybody has anything for Mary, feel free to reach out. Is there anyone else that has any wants or needs? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, hi, I'm Jean. I just wanted to chime in for a second. So pretty much um, uh, kind of uh, the same. I'm, I'm new to real estate, so this would be my first property, but I would like to ideally house hack. Um, my range, though, is a little bit probably, probably like 800,000, I think um just to be safe because it's just me but um but yeah I think I'm a little bit open to um all of LA since I'm working from home for, 
for now. So that's kind of where I'm where I'm at. Do you have a preference in terms of area, Gina? Yeah, I would. I mean, I think um, so. I work at I I just got a new job at Disney, so I would ideally like to be in like the the Burbank, Glendale, Pasadena area. However, I doubt I can get something for eight hundred thousand. So with that said, my next best would like to be Inglewood um, or um, Culver City. And then next best would be like South Bay, which I'm familiar with, like Carson area or Torrance. Um, but I'm again, I know my range is a little bit um, stifling. So whatever it kind of looks like a nice neighborhood that I can get for you. And like a two by two, something where I can get like a long term person. So it could be a duplex or up to a fourplex, but I imagine that cost wise, it'll probably be a duplex, ideally two bedrooms. So one thing you might want to consider, Gina, I, I live in Burbank, uh, okay. is um, I would start considering these areas that are just east of Burbank. So yeah. North Hollywood is definitely should be on your list, but also uh, Arletta, Pacoima, Sun oh. Valley, like any of these kind of valley areas that have oh. um, that are that are neighboring to Burbank. And okay. those areas do have stuff in your range. Oh, okay, okay, that makes sense. Okay, so if, I mean, just, just I'm just thinking for you, the drive from yeah. Torrance to Burbank could be painful. So, mm -hmm. um, so if you, if you're planning to, you know, we're, if you're, if you're having to drive to Burbank, then I would suggest that you look in some of these, uh, what I would call uh, East Valley areas and, um, you know, even out to Van Nuys, um, you know, that would be a lot, there, there is stuff in your range in those areas. Okay. Well, maybe like Panorama City would be a great Panorama area City is another great area. I don't know, is that Danielle? Yes. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right, Danielle. Panorama City is a, I'm, another I'm only great Wonder area. Woman because I'm in my pajamas because it's 8.15 here. Hey, so Wonder, Woman, Wonder Woman is always Wonder Woman in pajamas or anything else, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? If not, we are going to move to our esteemed speaker, Bob Pace. Uh, Bob is president and co-owner of Commercial Real Estate Inspectors. Um, they specialize in um, commercial real estate inspections. Uh, I think primarily you do multifamily, if, I, if I'm to understand you correctly. I know that because I use Bob for all of my inspections. And um, he uh, has done well over 10,000 inspections. Uh, so if you have any questions with regards to uh, multifamily inspections, he is the man to ask, which is why we have him here today. This is going to be more, he doesn't really have a, a presentation. This is more, going to be more of a conversation, which means that anybody who has a question, like I said, just please raise your hand in the chat. Uh, it's under reactions. Uh, there's a, there's a, like a raise hand option. I'm going to start off by asking Bob a few questions. And then I figured we would just open up to the floor and see if any of you have any um have any have any questions that you have for yourself? So, Bob, please unmute yourself and introduce okay. yourself. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Bob Pace, uh, and thank you, Will. Uh, I've been around the block. Uh, started as a general contractor in the uh, Los Angeles area in 1984, and uh, one step after another. Uh, Doing home inspections became the thing to do. And because I had a lot of uh, background in commercial real estate, I moved into doing commercial real estate exclusively. And uh, apartment buildings, multifamily is probably between 40 and 60% of what we do. But we also do a lot of uh, office warehouse, office, medical, pretty much anything that somebody wants to invest into. And uh, probably my strength is that uh, I've got a lot of construction background. And so I can look at something and, and quickly determine whether it needs help. 
or if it's typical wear and tear. All right. Well, let's get started. Let's say let's let's throw a um, let's throw a scenario at you, Bob. You're arriving at a six unit property. Um, and um, what's the first thing you go for? Oh, good question. Um, currently, there's a whole area called the soft story. And uh, a lot of apartment buildings currently have what's called a soft story. And what that means usually is that there's tuck under parking. In other words, there's parking underneath where people are living. And that in the greater LA area, there's over 10,000 of those that have been mandated to be upgraded structurally so that they will withstand earthquake movement better than they did before. Um, that's probably one of the first things that I glance at. And the second one is generally, how is the exterior maintained? I found the vast majority of the time, uh, my first glance at a building, I can tell whether or not people are maintaining it or not. And eh, probably 80% of the time I found that to be true. Um, if it's in really good shape outside, it's almost always in good shape pretty much everywhere else. If it's not, rarely is it in good shape on all the interiors. So that's my first thing that I glance at. Hey, Mary, you have a question. Yes, hi, Bob. Hi. My, question, my question is when you go to an inspection, do you have a standard checklist that you always use? Um, or are you, are you, um, is a, buyer or seller or an agent asking you to check for specific things? That's a great question. Yes, I do have a standard checklist. It's anywhere from three to 500 different things that we go through to see whether it, it has it or not. And if it does have it, what condition it's in. However, one of the first things I like to do, and uh, my guys, there's eight of us, by the way, I'm the owner of the company, but I've got seven other people who do inspections and are part of the company is every owner usually has certain things that are important to them. Most of the time it's because they've had bad past experiences with things or somebody's told them, hey, make sure that your roofing is okay or that your plumbing is okay or, um, or what condition it's in. So my biggest focus is on the five major systems which are the electrical, the plumbing, the heating and air conditioning, if it has any, the structure of the building, and then moisture, not just the roof, but the site itself. How well is it handing, handling moisture? Um, as a slight, well, years ago, I did a seminar by a moisture specialist. And one of the things he brought up, he's also a lawyer, is that 80% of all litigation in real estate has to do with moisture. And mm -hmm. after having done over 10,000 inspections, moisture is the big ticket item, almost always. It can create mold, it can create all sorts of issues. So our focus is very high degree on moisture and moisture related issues. Absolutely. So, um... Give us an example of maybe a, um, an inspection you did recently uh, that you had a moisture issue and what did you find? Another good question. Um, there's two areas, probably the, uh, the most significant one recently was, uh, um, it was a large uh, industrial site that I think it was built in the early 80s, if I recall correctly, and it had not had the roof redone. It had been patched and patched and patched and patched. And um, typical life for roofs is anywhere from 15 to 50 years, depending on the type and the style. Uh, any roof that's got some slope to it lasts longer. Any roof that's flat 
has a tendency to wear out much quicker and leaks are much more involved. And the particular one that I'm referring to had moisture stains. I lost count after 15 or 20 in the office areas. And one of the biggest potential issues with moisture stains is mold. And some people are affected adversely by mold. Some people aren't. Uh, apparently it's a little bit like the COVID currently. You know, some people get it and didn't even know they had it, get tested and find out they got the antibodies. And others uh, obviously goes the other direction. Right. Diana, you have a question. Um, hi, I, hi. I just want to make a comment, Bob. Um, I, you know, we've met a couple of times and I, one of the things I really like about working with you is that, um, when you're working with the buyer that's at the place or just the, the different parties, um, one of the things that, um, you and your team do really well is that you don't alarm the buyers. And, um, I think that's, um, especially with buyers that are, sort of newer at buying everything is everything feels really scary but um i think you and your team are really good at being able to break things down and kind of create solutions for what um some of the issues are you know and so they, they can decide whether or not that's a property that they want to move forward with Thank so you. um yes and i second you on the moisture so we've had some experiences in the past year with uh moisture that became really issues so right it definitely can well in that regard um one of the views having been a general contractor for a, a lot of years and built a lot of different projects um anything can be solved it's just money and if people are investing in properties they're going to have to invest some money in maintenance maintenance is probably the the biggest area um uh quick story we went over to Europe a few years ago and what really hit me we were over in uh, Hungary and, and Germany and is how many of the properties there are hundreds of years old and they're still in great shape and here in America if you have a house that's 100 years old it's rare that it doesn't it hasn't been torn down it, it's uh, they rarely last 100 years we don't maintain things uh, nearly as well to me as they do in Europe. So um, uh, thank you for the, the kind words and yeah, anything can be fixed. And, oh, I remember uh, something that came up there just a minute ago. One of the things that I try to do when we arrive at the site is not make it a cookie cutter inspection. In other words, every inspection isn't the same. Every client has their own concerns, their own needs and wants. Some need their hands held a lot, as anybody who deals in the business knows. And some are very savvy buyers. Uh, I had a buyer one time that uh, I'd done a number of projects for, and uh, I finished with the inspection. And uh, right about the time he arrived, and he walked up to me and he said, uh, he was from Scotland, he goes, is there anything horrible? And I said, no, he said, good. And handed me a check and turned around and walked away. That's a pretty savvy buyer, but we had done a lot of inspections together. And then I had one just a couple of days ago with a, a client that uh, after the inspection was over, had 45 minutes worth of questions. Well, some do, and uh, that's their right. Uh, they're, they're paying for my time. And uh, I try to answer all their questions as best as I know how. By no means do I know all the answers. And um, I really try to stay away from what I consider to be others' jobs. Meaning they say, is this a good deal? Oh, I'm not even going there. Not even gonna touch that one. That, that, that's personal. Um, I told one very savvy buyer I had, uh, I honestly told him, I said, I think you need to walk away from this. And he said, why? And I said, because everything has been screwed up. They put, roofing on decks and and on and on and uh, took apartments and cut them in two to where one of the entries to some of the apartments was a sliding glass door which is not supposed to be and on and on and on and, and uh, he goes oh, okay 
And I saw him oh, a few months later and he said, that was one of the best deals I ever made because uh, we made, we put a hundred thousand dollars into it and sold it for $400,000 more. And so at that point I realized, no, that's not my area. That's uh, will that's, that's your area. Um, and there you have it. Thank you. Uh, sure. Ray, you have a question. Uh, Ray, you need to um, unmute yourself, please. For the moisture area, the roofing, of course, um, how about bathrooms and what do you recommend for that? Well, uh, it depends on what you're referring to. If you're referring to like around the tub, around the, where the tub and the, the uh, toilet meet area. No, more ventilation. Need, pardon? Ventilation, I've seen a lot of buildings that oh. don't have fans, older ones yeah. that aren't. And that just, every time you go into a unit, they have like as a sauna. Yeah, that is probably, that is one of the biggest areas that's a problem. And most of those are problems in units so from the 50s and earlier and older. Typically units built in, in the 70s and later have fans in them. I think you're generally talking about the older ones that don't have any fans in them. Uh, if you're talking about ones with fans, on either. Pardon? I have a unit built in '84 that doesn't have any fans. Plus, well, my 1920 unit definitely doesn't. Uh, okay, if if it doesn't have a fan in it, then it has to have an openable window that would allow for sufficient um, uh, ventilation. And the problem with those typically is that people don't open them up. And when they don't open them up, exactly what you're talking about happens in the mold at the edges of, of the tile and the tub and, or the shower or wherever starts happening or it goes onto the ceiling, which is pretty common. Um, the only way I know to handle something like that is to install a fan that comes on as soon as you turn on the light. It is, a, it is an option. Sometimes it's not a practical option, particularly if you have a two-story building. And uh, you'd have to actually put it into the side wall and it can get a bit involved. So uh, th th that can be a little bit tricky. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, very true. Um, thank you, Ray. Uh, Ryan. Hi, Bob. Uh, Hello, thanks Ryan. For, thanks for being here today. Uh, my um, pleasure. I, I did have a question. So uh, my wife and I bought a rental property uh, in Pennsylvania, actually. We, we live in the LA area, um, but moisture is definitely uh, a known issue uh, out there. And so kind of a, a situation that we we're looking at is that we found like kind of in the, the basement, which is partially finished, um, that there's some mold um, kind of on the, just, you know, on the wall kind of near the baseboard. Right. And so the inspector that we had just in his notes, just said, you know, seek remediation. Uh, but we knew that some guys that were in there cleaned it, uh, you know, just with some disinfectant. But I've kind of heard stories like sometimes it can be like actually inside the wall. Other times I've heard it's like, well, no, there's just humidity in the basement. And if it hasn't been cleaned in a while, mold can form. I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on kind of next steps and whether I should kind of tear into the wall to see what's, <laughs> see if there's anything in there or not. <laughs> Good question. Uh, let me ask a couple of questions. The walls that they're in, is the earth that's outside, is it above the floor level? For where it's located, possibly, because there, there is a cement, um, because it's the, the whole uh, ground is kind of at an angle. And right. so the, the basement you know, it's just a, a, an outdoor access, you know, it's through a door out the back, but up against the front, you know, it's, it's completely underground. So possibly. I got you. Okay. Those are probably the trickiest. And uh, usually the problem with those is, is it's coming from the outside. In other words, um, the only way to keep it coming from the outside, we, I used to do this back in uh, Kansas City, um, go Chiefs is that the oh, chiefs <laughs> oh, yes. big, big chief wow. fans uh, have been since <laughs> the early 60s that's a whole nother subject but the only way to really stop that from happening is is to stop it from the outside and to stop it from the outside you got to dig down and it's it's messy and involved and 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 costly 
one option to I'm not a big fan of this, but it's, uh, they sell a lot of it. There's a type of product called dry lock. Um, there's uh, other types of that product, but essentially it's something that you brush on just like paint and it keeps the, or helps slow down the rate of the water intrusion. The problem with it, if you put it on the inside is it's a little bit of a band-aid aspect of things. You're not stopping it at its source. Um, if is the basement finished in other words has there walls with drywall and that sort of thing there on on about two-thirds of it yes and then there's okay. another door where you have you know the the hvac and and water heater and all that kind of stuff and that's unfinished um i have found though that some of the cement grading down the side isn't sloping completely away um from the wall but there's also a downspout from the gutter that cuts off about six feet that's kind of running down the siding. So there could be a couple of different areas. I'm just trying to figure out, yeah, do I tear into the wall or do I just try to fix those things and then see what happens? <laughs> right, well, here's some gradient things. And interesting enough, I own basically identical properties in Kansas City now. I've, I've got uh, seven different uh, single family residence uh, uh, rentals and a sixplex, but there the biggest problem was the, the walls themselves were built uh, without reinforcement in them. And the ground outside is clay. When it gets wet, it expands and it pushes the walls in, which makes them crack, which means when it gets wet, it leaks in. So it involves a lot of different things. One thing you can do, uh, and it's all on a gradient, meaning we'll start inexpensive and then go to the expensive. You can put a dehumidifier in there, which will help remove the moisture um, and sometimes uh, you put a dehumidifier in there and the next thing you know, it just keeps filling up. It just keeps filling up. Well, that shows you you really needed to do that. Um, another option is to, um, is, to, is to tear into the walls and make sure, at least in a couple of spots, and make sure you're not having real problems inside the walls. If you are having problems inside the wall, I don't know any way other than to, unfortunately, tear that stuff out. And, and, and start dealing with the, I, I assume, is it a block wall or do you know? Um, I don't know. I know it is towards the front, um, uh, but once you get back to the open area, I'm not sure if that's all um, stoned or not. Typically it would be the same. Uh, when was it built? I was built like 1910. It's about, it's about 100, 110 years old. All right. It could literally be a stone foundation and very well may be. And I know there's no waterproofing on the outside because they just didn't do it <laughs> at that point in time. You didn't, didn't think there, about there's, it. There's definitely some deterioration of whatever coating they had on there. Right. Um, but yeah. 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 Uh, and to dig down on the outside on a, on a stone foundation would be... Um, <laughs> to say dicey would, would probably not be a good idea. Um, that's not an easy one. And it would take somebody to actually you know, see it. But realistically, it being of its age, you're probably at some point going to have to tear out all the built in walls on the inside. Re, it's called tuck point, but basically you take and, 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 and clean up all the, the stone mortar that's there. And then you can parge it, which means to put a layer of literally concrete over that. You can put some waterproofing inside of that concrete. And uh, if it was me, I would probably recommend leaving it like that. It's very rustic, but uh, it would allow you to know later on if it rains and whatnot, where it's leaking and where you need to address. And then that's just on the inside. But on the outside, you brought up some great ones. One is putting downspouts, getting it away from the house, well away, making sure that the earth on the outside is sloping away from the house. Um, things like that, trying to, <laughs> in doing a seminar many years ago with a uh, moisture specialist, he said something that I found very true. He calls wet happens, just like <laughs> other things happen. And so he said, the only thing you're really trying to do is you're trying to control it because it's going to get wet. You know, that's why you have roofing and that's why you have downspouts and that's why you have gutters and all these other things. 
So you, what you want to do is control that water. I would start with the very simple, you mentioned a downspout, getting an extension, getting it away from the house, getting it down to where it's rolling, you know, down and away from the house. Um, gutters, make sure that they're clean, that they're functioning properly, that the earth is sloped away from the house. Um, you might even put, uh, and I've, I've done this personally, is put, uh, usually it's at least a two foot, it's called, it's, it's a ribbon. Basically it's concrete that runs into the house itself and, and slopes away from the house and down. So that again, you, you just keep, you're trying to push the water away from the house. Those are right off the top of my head thoughts. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's that was incredibly helpful. The yeah, the inspection report was very vague in general. I was like, I have no idea what to do about it. Uh, but that definitely gives me a better idea. So thank you. Great. I'm glad I could help. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions before we get to the fun section? <laughs> okay. So now the fun part. Now we're gonna talk about horror stories. <laughs> What's the craziest thing you've ever seen at inspection? I'm gonna I'm gonna start. Okay, so uh, five years ago, Diana was pregnant with our second child, and we were in escrow on a a fiveplex in Echo Park, and she was trying to get up the stairs but there was so much stuff on both sides of the staircase. She had to walk sideways to walk up. And as soon as she got to the top, the inspector said, get out of here. <laughs> and, uh, and that was because there were so many electrical sockets, <laughs> so many electrical plugs in a single socket. He was like, you need to leave because this is a fire hazard. <laughs> okay, now, Going back to what Bob said about value, all right, we actually got that deal. We actually closed on that deal, okay? And a year and a half later, we sold it for three times purchase, <laughs> okay? So just because it doesn't like inspect well, it doesn't necessarily, like Bob said, mean that it's not necessarily a good value. You have to see what the value is. You just have to know through the inspection, what you're getting yourself into. That's the key, in my opinion. Bob, please share with us some of your <laughs> best stories. Uh, the uh, Well, there's an awful lot of them, uh, but probably the one that, that always surprises me are hoarders. And um, we've had them before that, uh, Probably one of my favorite ones was uh, one that was uh, Christmas. Everything was Christmas. And um, you couldn't walk through. You couldn't see the floor. You, uh, it had, it, sorry, there were shelves. I, I didn't, I, I honestly didn't know what the uh, sexual persuasion was of the, of the client who was in the, uh, uh, in their unit, uh, had shelves everywhere with dolls uh, on them. Um, and it literally probably would have taken close, and this is a one bedroom, uh, one bathroom apartment, it would take close to a dumpster to pull everything out. Now, this was actually done relatively aesthetically. So I, when I say you couldn't walk on the floor, it's because they had uh, layer after layer of costumes on the floor. So there was that. And on the other end of the spectrum, um, I'm just going to say one word. Diapers. It was, it, it was by far the worst ever. And if you could imagine somebody that was, that was hoarding, you, sorry, two words, used diapers. Oh. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah, that was uh, we actually had to call the health department and uh, it was it was not not pretty, not pretty. Yikes. <laughs> anyway, those are those are the the two um, 
the last one I don't think needs much elaboration. It, it creates a picture in your mind that, uh, uh, yeah. That, that we didn't need to know. Okay. Right. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Bob? Mary, I see your hand up. And you're muted. I have a, I have a horror story. Ah. <laughs> uh, um, a sp speaking of moisture, uh, managed a house, a uh, beautiful home in Pacific Palisades in Rustic Canyon, where you know it's um, shady. And this house, um, like five bedroom house, and we got. Uh, got a service request from the tenant saying, I don't know what this is. It's a, it's in the corner of the, my kid's bedroom and he just discovered it. And it's like, sent a picture of this big yellow blob. And it was actually a mushroom that had grown from the outside through the wall <laughs> and like six inches long into the carpet. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't black mold. It wasn't yellow. It was a big mushroom. Okay. Yeah. Hey, that's horrifying. Um, I do have a question. So please. So um, this is a question for Bob and also, you know, Will, Diane, and other agents. Um, I've watched enough HDTV to know that when people flip, they, you know, they do a really good job doing the, um, cosmetic work. So for example, you know, cracks uh, and moisture could probably be covered over by, you know, a new layer of paint, something like that. So how invasive, um, can you do, you know, your in inspections? For example, for moisture and for plumbing, are you able to cut holes? And for agents, you know, how do you negotiate this uh, with the seller? Because at this point, you're not in contract yet. So will they allow you to, you know, dump things down the drains and open up holes in the walls? Well, if, if you want me to answer, I can. Typically, you can do no invasive testing whatsoever until you own the property. Now, um, what you're typically, what's important is that whoever is doing, this is just from the inspection side, as far as the agent goes, that's a, that's a whole different subject. But as far as the inspector goes, <sighs> my personal recommendation is somebody who's been around the block a lot. And uh, gray hair has a tendency to uh, say a lot if they're still doing inspections and they have gray hair, then, then they're obviously doing something right. Um, but I'm not a fan of being the inspector who is there to find out what's wrong. Right at first, that's like, wait, what do you mean? Aren't you there? I'm not saying I'm not there to find out what's wrong. I, to me, I'm really there to find out what is. There are good things and there are things that probably aren't good. But my goal as an inspector and what I've taught probably somewhere close to 50 different inspectors now is your goal is to find out what is and to make sure that your client does whatever they're doing with their eyes open. We have certain limitations. Uh, a specific one would be the plumbing. We can look at certain pipes and we can see rust on the outside of the pipes because it's older plumbing. That's actually a leak. That started from the inside and worked its way to the outside. If we see that type of plumbing, it's called galvanized. It's stuff that was pretty much quit being used in the late seventies. It's used up, it's done. It's at the end of its life. You really should replace it, period. There are certain type of uh, electrical sub panels, you know what a sub panel is? It's a little electrical panel that's sitting on the wall. You open it up and it's got a few switches inside. There are certain brands, one in particular called Federal Pacific, that there isn't an electrician around who's worth a salt that wouldn't say you need to change them out. They have a tendency to, for the breakers to not trip when they should, which is a fire hazard. It's also a health hazard. Um, so having somebody who's, who's experienced is probably your biggest help in that area. 
and um, but as far as intrusion goes, it's not allowed. And I'll let Will, you know, talk from his viewpoint on that. No, I, I hear what you're saying, uh, Valerie. Like I, I actually the first house Diana and I, I bought together was one of these flips, and I call it lipstick on a pig, right? Like <laughs> they, they make it like. I mean, it's painted nice. Maybe there's some floor, flooring and whatever. Uh, and, but there were serious issues. You know, we had serious plumbing issues. We had electrical issues. We had major foundation issues. So we're, you know, that a good inspector will help you find those things out and then negotiate. I will tell you that inspector that I used for that particular deal, I don't use him anymore. And there's a reason is because he missed a major thing when I found out later, which is that he missed that there was no exhaust pipe for the hot water heater, okay? And wow. that's a big miss. And I found this out later when we, went to, when we went to replace our hot water heater. Our plumber was like, you don't have an exhaust pipe for this thing. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, there's no exhaust pipe for this thing. So that meant that all the carbon monoxide was going back into our house. Okay, that's very, very dangerous. So I don't use that inspector anymore. Uh, that's why it is important to have an experienced inspector who knows what they're doing, knows what they're looking for, and uh, can hopefully tell you if it's lipstick on a pig or not. Any other questions? Bob, thank you so much for your time. Um, let's put your information here in the chat so everybody knows uh, your, you know, how to contact you. So it's Bob Pace, right? Commercial CRE inspectors, right? Uh, CREI, CREI, which, which stands for Commercial Real Estate Inspectors. Okay. And the uh, phone number is eight one eight. Uh huh. Nine five seven. Mm hmm. Four six five four. Okay. And what is your website? Uh, it's C R E I L L C dot com. C R E I L L C dot com. Correct. Okay. Or commercial real estate inspectors dot com, but nobody wants to type all that out. <laughs> That, well, you know, but that's easy to remember. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. Commercial that's why real we chose estate. the name. Nobody ever asked us what we do. Exactly. Uh, well, I just want to thank you so much for your time. It was very interesting, very helpful. I think everybody got a lot out of this. And, uh, you know, we appreciate your time and may have you back to answer some more questions. My pleasure, Will. Anytime. Hopefully we'll see each other again soon out in the field. Oh, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. Uh, Very good. I will, I will hand it back to you, Anthony. All right, everybody. I guess that's about it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, remember, if you'd like to join us at our next seminar, it's lahomebuyerseminar.com, Thursday, November 4th at 4 o'clock. We'd love to see you there. Um, and follow that 1031 exchange um, updates. We'll keep you on that, but it's looking really good. So spread the word and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining. Thanks everybody. Thank you.